to introduce our next speaker and to move on to our topic of disease. Uh, Mike Munster has been responsible for diagnosing diseases on ornamentals and commercial clients as nursery and greenhouses since 2009. He has a bachelor's degree in an agronomy, can't say the word all of a sudden. Okay. Help me out, Chris. Agronomy. Agronomy, thank you. From the University of uh, Minnesota and master's in plant pathology from NC State University. He's a regular presenter on the online plants, pests, and pathogens series for Master Gardener volunteers. He will discuss infectious diseases that occur on ornamental plant species in Central North Carolina landscapes. He'll explore the pathogens that cause plant disease, their importance, dispersal, survival. We'll also see examples of problems you can self-diagnose. Um, I know Chris was looking at some of his slides, so I think that you're in for a real treat. So please welcome Mike Munster. by mentioning something about the, the handout, and I apologize for whichever handout was on the table there, I'm borrowing for a moment. One, she has a list of several easily recognizable plants, oh, they, they print it in front of back. Oh, this is my copy, this is the original. <laughs> yep. um, so we'll talk about most of the things here in the section on easily recognizable, or readily recognizable plant problems, our RPPs. The other is a slightly modified list of some best practices for disease prevention and management, uh, slightly modified from the version that's in the extension gardener handbook, which I'll mention as a resource at the end. And don't worry, when I get to the end and show these resources and the websites, and don't worry about copying down those URLs because they're right there on the sheet. Now I won't be going over these practices in my talk today, but I hope that by the end of it, you'll understand why these things are important and the mechanism for why they are our management strategies against plant diseases. As uh, you heard in the introduction, I myself am a transplant, came to North Carolina in 1984, and was away some back, away some more, left six years in Mexico, came back. Uh, my wife is from Mexico, I actually proposed to her here in the the Arboretum? She said yes. <laughs> uh, so this is kind of a special place for me. My background, or my, excuse me, my work at the clinic is with diagnosing disease problems on ornamental plants for commercial plants, greenhouses and nurseries. So I'm going to be focusing especially on that, but I will have some examples that I'll toss in there on the, uh, the vegetable world, the, the vegetable garden, and also very little from turf, which I really don't have expertise in. <coughs> so just that is a, a disclaimer up front. Let me ask how many of you, I noticed that very few hands went up or, uh, when you were asked who was new to gardening. So congratulations to those who are on the But those who are not new to gardening, I'm curious if you're from somewhere else. So, so, so we are the transplant. A little story. When I first came here, she was talking about the dangers of doing <coughs> research at the golf course. Uh, I had a little incident when I was doing my research and my plots out off of Lake Weirder Road. I'm from the Upper Midwest, so I learned weeds up there, and I saw some weeds in my plot. And I, oh, there's some pigweed here, and I reached down to pull it out, and I learned that there's a plant that occurs here, not there called spiny amaranth. <laughs> so not all knowledge is transferable. Some is, but some is. So that's one problem that we face being transplanted. Uh, another is, if you're from anywhere north of here, you notice that there's a lot of heat here. And that tends to favor some of our plant diseases. If you're from anywhere west of here, west of the Mississippi, then you'll notice that it's a lot moister here. So that also tends to favor uh, plant diseases. So we're, we're up against some of these challenges. Of course, we do have the benefit of the extended growing season, which is wonderful, but we do have some special challenges as well. 
without any further ado, let's go ahead and get started. I want to turn all the lights off. I might fall asleep up here. I'm trying to avoid that. And I'm going to start out with this kind of a, a Richter scale of plant diseases. I said to Steve beforehand, your problem is that people look at a, an insect on a plant and they assume that it's bad. My problem is that they look at a disease on a plant and they assume that it's fatal. So not all plant diseases are created equal. They, they differ in their degrees. Also, as Steve said, apart from the part about uh, nobody lives forever, I think the most important thing he said was, I'm a scientist and there's always nuances. Mm. So don't take this as extremely strictly always applicable, but as a general guide and as a first approximation, I think this is helpful to remember this order of importance. So our least significant plant disease problems are going to be the leaf spots and powdery mildews, especially on deciduous plants. Slightly more serious would be the canker diseases, and I'll mention what those are and what they look like, how to recognize them. Then getting more serious would be root and stem rot. And finally, <coughs> I think you could argue that the most serious ones are the vascular rope diseases. And again, I'll give a few examples from each of these categories, starting out with the leaf spots and powdery mildews. How many of you have seen this? <laughs> All right, do you know what it is? All right. It's called leaf blister. We're just slightly more creative than the entomologists with our names. <laughs> this is oak leaf blister. It's a really a cosmetic disease. The infection occurs in the spring. It starts out as kind of a light green spot, a little bit um, convex in shape. And then getting around June, that spot dies out. And you think that it's spreading because it appears to be getting worse. But really, the infection occurred earlier, and nothing new is happening except that the tissue is dying out. And so it appears to be getting worse. But this is strictly a cosmetic problem. Some years it will be worse than others. But remember, this tree is shedding those leaves at the end of the season. And they can even take some, some diseases do cause defoliation. But a deciduous tree can, tree can withstand a certain amount of defoliation and still be fine. Powdery mildews, this varies. On some plants, they're just a, a light cosmetic or uh, problem or curiosity. On others, especially euonymus here, as Steve said, if you've got euonymus, you've got scale. Mm -hmm. If you've got euonymus, you've also got powdery mildew on it. And it can be very heavy if you just end up dallying with that. Then, uh, then it may not be worth keeping the plant. But you can also see we have on Coryopsis here, on ironweed. Mostly we're going to see those patches of whitish to gray material that is the, the, the growth of the fungus and the sporulation of the fungus on the surface. If you get some other cases, though, like on dogwood, it may be a very fine coating. We actually have to hold the leaf up to the sun at an angle in order to really be able to see the network of, of fungal threads, we call them hyphae, on the surface of the leaf there. So you might look at that and think that you just had some heat or drought stress. But there's actually a powdery mildew fungus at work here. But again, these are, or tend to be, the, among the least serious of our, our plant diseases. It's a little bit of a different story when we move from the deciduous to the evergreen. Now, I, I suppose it's because they need these needles for a longer period of time. So if you do get a needle disease, a needle cast disease, then it's going to be more serious. This one is called uh, Passalora needle blight. Um, these were Leyland cypress, I believe. Mm -hmm. And you can see that you've got an ornamental plant. Even though it may not die, you've lost the ornamental quality to it. <laughs> and the screen, if it was because you didn't want to see the neighbors or they didn't want to see you. <laughs> Now, when I say leaf spots, there's kind of a caveat there. Not everything that is a spot on a leaf is actually a leaf spot. There can be other factors. <coughs> so as tissue starts to <coughs> senesce at the end of the season, you're going to get some of these secondary <coughs> leaf spots occurring. You may have spots or blotches that are actually a manifestation of a wilting that's going on in the plant. So it may be a problem lower down. And there are a few leaf spots or speckling, things like that, that can be caused by arthropod feeding, insects and mites and so forth. So don't assume that you've got a foliar infection 
just because you see something that looks like a spot on a leaf. Now, these are cucumber leaves. Anybody want to venture a guess as to what caused these leaves to look like this? Nope. They were infected with root knot, root knot nematodes. So the compromised root system couldn't supply the leaves well enough, and you start getting these kind of reactions in the foliage. Moving up the next step in our scale here, cankers. And canker simply is a, a dead lesion, a necrotic lesion, we call it, on a woody plant part. So sometimes these are quite obvious, and, and sometimes not. I'll show you how you would look for that. But both cankers and root rots, which is the next step, can lead to plant decline and uh, dieback. So how would you tell the difference? Well, one thing to look for, and it's not 100%, but one thing to look for is, is it just an individual branch or two <coughs> that are showing the symptoms? So you can see the rhododendron here in the upper left, where just that one shoot is wilting and the others appear to be fine. So that leads us to think that something's happening, we don't know what yet, somewhere down this branch that girdled it and is causing the water not to move up to that branch. Whereas the azalea on the right, notice that it's just <coughs> has a general decline, leaves kind of falling off, poor leaf color, small leaf size, lichens are growing on it. Lichens do not cause plant disease, but they can let you know that the plant has not been growing well. <coughs> Excuse me. Now again, this is not 100% because you can get some root rots that will just kill sections of the plant first. Well, when we're looking for cankers, <coughs> it may be visible on the surface of the stem, like this botrytis canker on rose, kind of a light brown color, a little bit dry looking here compared to the healthy cane here. But sometimes you're going to have to actually look under the bark. On this loropetalum branch, there was no evidence of the canker on the surface, but once you take your knife out and start cutting there, then you can see that the candom died in this area. And it may extend even into the wood. You can see in this cross-section of some azalea stems with Phelopsis canker, this often high section shape of the affected wood in the branch. And jumping ahead to the very end, what I'll mention that if you ever do need to send samples in to your, take a sample to your county cooperative extension office or to us, the clinic, that one of the things you're going to look for on a sample is that transition zone between the healthy and the dead tissue. Because if you get all something that's completely dead or something that's completely healthy, that's not going to be where the agent is active that's causing it. This one here kind of looks nasty, but it's not a cancer. It turned out to be just some kind of a physical, mechanical wound, but then the bar keeled over. And we know that because when I cut away here, that cambium and that wood are perfectly healthy. So our next step in seriousness would be root and stem rots. Root rots being for either herbaceous or woody plant stem rots. More we would talk about that in the, uh, with herbaceous perennials and with the vegetable garden. Sometimes it's obvious. The root system just looks like a nasty mess. This was a holly bush from a school <coughs> several years ago. And this had both phytophthora root rot and black root rot on it. But sometimes it's hard to tell. With trees and shrubs, often the roots are just naturally a dark color and you don't know if it's rotting or not unless you do this easy test. So find a root and then uh, hold it between the thumb and forefinger, each hand, and pull in opposite, I guess it wouldn't be pulling if it wasn't in the opposite direction, but pull on that root and see if the outer portion will slough off of the inner vascular bundle like a bead on a wire. And if that happens, then you know you do have root rot in that particular root. So check a couple of those. It's an easy test to do to find out if you have root rot. Now, if it's a, an herbaceous plant, a bedding plant, for example, then it's a little bit easier to tell just by the color of the roots on examination. But the above-ground symptoms can be very similar. 
So here are two pictures, both by Sean Brown, <coughs> both from Johnson County, both Leyland Cypress, both plants that have been in the landscape for seven years before the problems arose, and you can see the general wilting and discoloration happening here. But you wouldn't be able to tell just looking at those, neither would I, what the cause was. And the one on the left happens to be, I think that's right, the one on the left was Armillaria root rot, and the one on the right was Phytophthora root rot. Those are our two biggest root rot problems on woody plants in North Carolina landscapes. To diagnose Phytophthora root rot, we need a sample of the fine feeder roots, and we do a laboratory assay. It takes about three days. To diagnose our malaria root rot, the real sample that we need is pretty destructive. We need that section of the bottom of the main stem, and we're going to peel the bark off, and we're going to see if the, the mat of fungal hyphae uh, or mycelium is there present between the bark and the wood. Or we need some roots that are, say, thumb size, thumb diameter, or larger. So that's not the test that you want to do unless you already know that this plant is going to be removed. And then again, some of our most destructive diseases, fortunately not necessarily the most common ones, are the vascular wilt. Here we're talking about organisms that inhabit the xylem of the plants, sometimes flown and cause, oh, more the xylem. And, uh, and cause disease that way, so they're systemic. Probably the most famous one there, Dutch elm disease, which I was not in North Carolina at the time when, when Dutch elm disease hit, but in the Midwest it did some terrible things to our, our <coughs> landscapes. A vascular pathogen transmitted by a beetle. Uh, another one is verisilium wilt. You can see this uh, black-eyed Susan here. This is from a research plot up there in the mountains last year, they were doing a test for uh, plants tolerant of Phytophthora root rot, but they had other things going on, and this one happened to have verticillium wilt. Now, a word about verticillium wilt. This is one of the most often self-misdiagnosed self plant diseases out there. There's a lot of information on the internet about verticillium wilt on maple trees, I think, particularly. Mm -hmm. So people have a problem with their maple tree, and that's one of their first assumptions. Oh, I have verticillium wilt. But you probably don't. If you're out in the mountains, anybody here from the mountains? No, all central. So you probably don't have Verticillia wilt. It just, it just doesn't tolerate the high temperatures this far east. Um, but here this plant in the mountains did, did have it. Another vascular wilt disease that's kind of in the news is laurel wilt. So if you happen to be down toward the coast, anybody from that way? Just a couple. So you may have heard about the red bay trees succumbing to that. That one is also transmitted by an insect. The verticillium wilt, though, is soil borne. So this is coming in through the roots. Another one that's really important is bacterial wilt. And that is especially a problem in tobacco. Well, tobacco's got a name called bramble wilt. And tomato in the vegetable garden. Uh, that is a bacterium. Once it's in the soil, it will stay there. And you have a problem with the tomatoes from, from that point forward. There's not a whole lot can be done about it. Some work is going on regarding grafted plants that, uh, that may be an answer, but that's a, a real serious one. So vascular diseases either transmitted by insects or soil. Here is a vascular disease that is not as serious, but it's very interesting. It's systemic, it's chronic. This redbud tree. We have pictures going back at least to 2010 with the symptoms of this. But every year it leaves out fine. It was 2014 in May, looks great. June, looks great. And then the heat of the season comes on in July, and we start seeing these scorching-like symptoms around the margin of the leaf. This year that tree was delayed. It didn't really get good symptoms until, until August, and even then they weren't that many branches affected. Now it's starting to look, to look worse, but the tree will be infected for the rest of its life and probably not as, not grow as well as it would otherwise, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to continue to survive. Now, if this gets on sycamore and it really looks terribly ratty, um, there's a strain that gets on grape that causes Pierce's disease. It's one of our most serious diseases of grapes in North Carolina. <coughs> 
So I kind of hinted at some of the things that, uh, that cause these problems. And we need to, to put a little bit of a, a formal structure to it. So what's causing all this? And what are the usual suspects? And pretty much the first thing I've got to say is, probably the most important thing I'll say all day. Oftentimes, it's not a disease. It may look like one, but many other things cause problems at our plants. In fact, I like to tell students, the most dangerous organism for our plants is homo sapiens. <laughs> <laughs> we get things like well, Mother Nature too. So freeze injury, drought, excess fertilizer, nutrient deficiencies, higher low soil pH, improper planting. So we see this root system of this shrub that was all tangled up like that. It had been grown too long in the pot before it was transplanted. Uh, and then who knows how well it was actually transplanted. Herbicide injury, you can see the crepe myrtle here with evidence of herbicide injury. Um, these shrubs here are from the yard of a co-worker of mine, Dr. Chuck Hodges. He's 88 years old, he comes in every morning and works just in the mornings diagnosing tree problems and also does household mold. This is from his yard and these Japanese hollies had I think it was a combination of high soluble salts in the soil and hydrophobic soil. So the water was not actually getting and penetrating into the into the root. So keep that in mind. Very often, actually the problem isn't disease. But when it is, and that's when plant pathologists spring into action, mm -hmm. and we almost always start with a description of what we call the disease triangle. It's a way of understanding the three elements that are needed in order to have disease. If you're lacking any one of these, then you won't have it. So the first thing, of course, is you have to have a susceptible host. If you don't have a plant, you won't have a plant disease. And it's got to be one that's susceptible to that particular problem. And the converse, well, then the, uh, I actually don't have these in the order that I probably should. Another thing you need is a favorable environment. Remember how I mentioned that oak leaf blister may vary in its severity from one year to the next. Probably a lot of that has to do with the weather in the springtime and whether it was favorable or not. And then you need a competent pathogen. A pathogen is just a term for micro microorganism capable of causing disease. It's important to keep in mind that they're not universally competent though. So a particular pathogen, some of them have very wide host ranges and will affect a lot of different kinds of plants, such as the arbolaria root rot. That will affect pretty much every woody plant you would put out there. But some of them are very specific to only one family or one genus of plants. There's a fourth element to this needed, which is time. These things don't happen from one day to the next, although sometimes we get people say, you know, my tree died overnight or this just happened. We went away on vacation, we came back, and what's happening. But these things, if it is a disease, it actually was probably happening over a period of time before the symptoms were expressed. Four big things that, four big categories here of organisms that cause plant diseases. Number one by far are the fungi. And I don't want to get technical, but I'm including here with fungi some things that are technically fungus-like organisms belonging to a, a related <coughs> group. So the phytophthora, for example, would be, would be in there. But we're going to call them all fungi for purposes here. So you can see two examples, powdery mildew there again. And there's the <coughs> mat of fungal growth between the bark and the wood. Of, and this was an Atlantic cedar, I think. No. Yes. It's, uh, it was a cedar of some kind on the eastern part of the state. And you can see there on the base of the stem. Another group that's important are bacteria. In your landscapes, though, there are not going to be that many bacterial diseases that you'll encounter that are going to be serious. The one pictured here is fire blight. So you may see that on pear trees especially, or on apple trees. Another one would be bacterial leaf scorch, which I mentioned earlier. Um, bacterial wilt in the vegetable garden. So there are a few that are, that are important, but you're not going to see as many of these as you will of the fungal diseases. Nematodes. Now, do you remember Steve's first slide and he had that bar of different pictures at the top? 
Do you remember what the sixth one over was? <laughs> no? Okay. The sixth one over was some, a picture of some nematodes my, under the microscope. So you could actually see their, their microscopic roundworms, basically. If your cat or dog had worms, probably it was a nematode infection. Misconception number one is that all of them cause galls on roots. Now they do, the ones that live um, on land, actually most species are marine, if you ever watch Spongebob, uh, but the ones that live on land mostly live in soil and feed on roots, but only a few different groups will cause galling on the roots. So very often these are sort of invisible thieves that may be stunting, stressing your plants, and you don't realize that it's happening. Boxwood, for example, is susceptible to a number of different kinds of nematode, uh, not just the root knot, but also a couple of others that can cause stress on the above and symptoms on the above ground portions. And then finally, the most microscopic and submicroscopic are the viruses. We can't even see these with our equipment in the, in the clinic, so we have other ways of testing for them. But we start out by looking at the symptoms. They can be very many symptoms. It could be mosaics, ring spots. Um, on the tomato fruit here, that's tomato spotted wilt virus. Pretty much, again, speaking of the landscapes, the main virus problems that you'll have, I'm not talking about fruit trees here. That's a different area that uh, I'm not an expert in either. But tomato spotted wilt virus, in particular in tomatoes, but it gets on other things. Rose rosette virus, which we won't have time to talk about, which is extremely serious on rose bushes. Um, the other ones are probably, unless I'm just off the top of my head right now or having thought about it, those are probably your two biggest viruses that you're going to have to worry about in a landscape setting. Now, if you're a greenhouse grower, you know, then you want to worry about, it now. for example, invasion of chronic spot virus and so on. But for, for landscape purposes, for gardening purposes, those are probably your two biggest concerns in our area. I think of another one I'll, I'll try to mention. Also, as Steve said, no, not all insects are bad. Not all fungi, bacteria, viruses, and nematodes are bad. So he had a picture of nematodes. Certainly, it was uh, probably one of the entomo pathogenic nematodes that used, that's used for insect control. Fungi, you wouldn't have your, your beer and wine at the midnight in the garden if it weren't for the yeast fungi used in the fermentation process, right? So many of these are actually quite beneficial. Now remember the disease triangle, the second corner that we talked about was a favorable environment. So one of those factors, in many cases, not all, is that excess water tends to favor plant pathogens, such as the, the bacterial blight here from the greenhouse on the left, and this had, among other things, the, the one on the right, the plant from the NC State landscape, had uh, Phytophthora aerial blight. So those, those kind of diseases, the water molds like Phytophthora and Pythium especially, and the bacterial diseases, but also fungi in general, need moisture. And having excess moisture is even better for you. Another factor about the environment is that anything that stresses the plant will favor disease. So Steve gave you an example of azaleas growing in full sun and having more lace bugs. Well, this applies to diseases as well. This is large patch, which is a cool season problem on warm season grasses. So if you have warm season grasses and they're stressed by cool weather, that's when they get their greater disease problems. If you have cool season grasses stressed by warm weather, that's when they're going to tend to have disease problems. So whatever is unfavorable to the plant may give an advantage to the disease or to the pathogen. Excuse me. Here's another picture from Sean Banks, uh, Leyland Cypress screen. One tree that's obviously has been removed here. The symptoms showing up on the two adjacent trees. And what do you notice about the location? There's a slope here, right? So this would tend to be where water would, would accumulate. And on the uh, list of basic practices for preventing diseases is if you have drainage problems, plant in a raised bed. 
not necessarily a screen like this, but that's a, a very uh, important way of trying to reduce excess moisture against things like phytophthora. Like Besides asking, well, what does this particular pathogen really affect? There are two other questions I want you to keep in mind whenever you're learning about a new plant disease. One is, is how is it spread? And two of the basic means are by wind or through the air and by water, either water movement running across the landscape or water splash from rain or irrigation. And if we notice from the fungal world here, we can see that both can happen. So the fungus on the left, you notice that it's producing some spores. This is under the <coughs> microscope. Producing some spores and a little droplet of liquid. That's not going to easily just blow around. That's going to have to be either splashed by water or carried by you on your hands or tools or possibly by an insect. Versus the rust pustules that are pictured on the right, those are dry spores, and those are going to blow through the air and spread it that way. Other means of dispersal hinted at uh, just a moment ago here would be your insect and mite vectors. A vector is just simply an organism that's capable of carrying a pathogen or transmitting a pathogen. And we know this from human medicine, too. We know about the um, mosquito transmission of malaria <coughs> and dengue and other diseases. And that happens with plants. Particularly, well, mosquitoes don't affect plants, right? But uh, aphids will transmit diseases. Thrips will transmit some viruses, like the tomato spotted wolf virus I mentioned. White flies can, <coughs> leaf hoppers, even uh, more recently, the spittle bugs can transmit plant pathogens. <coughs> plant pathogens. And then finally, people, tools, and vehicles. So anything that, for example, will move soil, will move a soil-borne pathogen. Also, when we move plants on purpose, we can be moving problems. So would you buy these plants to put in your land? Well, of course not, because they're on my slide, so you know something's wrong with them, right? <laughs> but in this case, these had a, an infection. I think this was... Fusarium wilt or Fusarium stem or something like that, but at first glance you don't see it there. So you can have plants that have a latent infection, not showing symptoms yet, but that later it, it might show up. So you do want to be careful and inspect any plants that you that you move around, but you know that there's not a hundred percent guarantee that just because you don't see it, it's not there. Still, vigilance is important. Uh, an example: my sister-in-law. Uh, a couple of months ago wanted to give us a, a shrub that she had dug up or she was going to move it from one place to another but then she wanted to check she wasn't sure and I looked at it in the back of her vehicle and the roots were just covered with, with root knot. So you know, I said yeah this is not a plant that you want to move from one place to another. The other question besides how they spread is ask how does it survive and here it's mostly we're talking about surviving the winter months, or adversity. And there's several different modes in which this happens. One is on dead plant material. Some of these, for example, botrytis, a fungus here that causes grain mold, will do wonderfully on dead plant material. It doesn't need a living plant host to survive and reproduce. There's some advantage that we have in these cases because why? Yeah, we can eliminate that plant material. At the end of the year, we clean up the garden, we get these things out of here, we don't put the diseased material in the compost pile, and we're going to reduce the, what we call inoculum, for the next season. Others, it's more difficult. They may exist as some kind of resting structures in the soil. Some of them microscopic, and others not quite so. This is the tip of a pencil here, and you'll notice these little round objects that look like, they're about the size, color, of a radish seed, but they're actually sclerotia of a fungus called sclerotium rolfsii, and that is how that fungus will survive from one year to the next in your garden. Also on living plants, so weeds can be reservoirs of some of these, like the tomato, tomato spotted wilt virus that I mentioned earlier. Also in buds or, or cankers. 
So the, remember the, the oak leaf blister that I showed early on? So uh, that, that fungus will survive in the buds of the plant from one year to the next, and then the infection occurs in the spring from there. And here's an example of a canker. Uh, I think this might have been a Nyssa, a black comb. Did you see that canker here? And these small, dark structures are the what we call pruning bodies, where those, that produces spores. So that canker may be perennial and then carry the disease over from one year to the next. And believe it or not, there's some pathogens that survive in a warmer climate. So our downy mildew on cucurbits doesn't survive here. The winters are too cold. But it does fine in Florida, and the winds can bring it up here from the south each year. You never know exactly when it's going to arrive, but usually in May, sometime in early June, that disease first shows up in North Carolina. And we're, uh, we're watching for it. Or, of course, if somebody brings transplants from someplace where they're infected, then it can be more quickly. Right? Now, I'm going to. So over, that's, that's the kind of the general principles and why some of these things are important that we recommend doing for preventing and managing plant diseases. But you wouldn't want to leave a talk like this without seeing some actual diseases you can recognize yourself. The, now this, um, yeah, these are ones that are fairly, fairly reliable. There's some other important ones that you might have a good idea, but I've stayed away from those. Um, also, let me just say up front that I didn't include this picture, but the dangers of internet self-diagnosis. We got a picture sent in to us. Uh, someone thought they had box with blight. Now, there are some things that you can do to, to try and identify that, but um, the problem was that it wasn't box with the head in this yard. It was Japanese holly. <laughs> <laughs> so, again, caveats. Let's, let's look at some of these that you can recognize yourself. First, things that you might see in the late winter or into the early spring. And I put these in the form of some questions. So, here's the camellia, and the blossom has done this. And the question is, what did this damage? A bacterium, a fungus, an insect, or Jack Frost? Jack Frost, they're saying here? Could be. Frost will do this. But in this case, it won't. In this case, it was a fungus. It's very interesting, and it's actually fairly easy. Again, not 100%, but fairly easy to tell which you've got. You take the flower, even one that's fallen onto the ground, turn it over, and you pull the base of it off. And you look for a ring here, you can see it here too, of the fungal material, the fungal mycelium. And if you see that, then you've got Camellia petal blight. Hmm. Also, it's, it's pretty typical to see the, the blighting here, but then other portions of the petal that are healthy. Now, I have seen this, was it this year or the year or, or last, where it was very hard to see this. You couldn't quite make it out. But that's that's your basic test that you want to do to see if you have camellia petal blight versus frost. Question? Sorry. If, yes. If that was frost, would it have been brown from the outside in instead of the inside out? I think it would be more generally the, the flower brown instead of just sectionally, as you see here. Uh, this is actually a very uh, this is actually a very interesting system because the timing of the sporulation of this fungus it, it's timed with the flowering of the shrub. So that flower will drop off and it'll form a sclerotium in the soil, uh, on the soil surface and it'll just be inactive, sit there all summer and then all winter and in the springtime when the Camellia japonicus are blooming, that will then produce a very tiny mushroom like you wouldn't find unless you're really looking for it and know what to look for, that ejects spores into the air that then affect the blossoms. So. The remedy for this is possible to clean up these fallen blossoms and maybe come in with a mulch layer in the late winter so that you're keeping those spores from reaching the air once the, you know, there were spores there that, that passed the winter. 
Well, you won't probably know necessarily, so I would pick them all up. Mm -hmm. The question was, do you just pick up the affected ones or, or all of them? So, here's a, another camellia example, also from the springtime. And you see some of the leaves look normal, but others here are thickened and kind of waxy, a little bit of a white fuzz underneath them. And the question is, should you remove this shrub, pick off the galls, spray an insecticide, or spray a fungicide? There we go. Pick up those galls. Pick off those galls. But when do you want to do it? You want to do it before it starts producing spores on the, on the other side. Because those spores will, this is like uh, the oak leaf blister in, in this sense. It only has one cycle per year. And they will spend the summer in the buds ready to go for the next year. Third question. True or false? The arrows here, let me step out of the way show two different stages of the same disease. This is an eastern red sea. Here. Well, it turns out that if this is false, they're related, but it's not the same thing. The one on the left is cedar quince rust, or quince rust. It tends to form a smaller swelling versus the cedar apple rust, which forms that larger gall that we'll see, you'll see over the winter. And then in the springtime, when the first warm rains hit, oh, I'm sorry, first the quince rust, that's a close up there. But you do see the kind of orange mass of um, where the spores come out. That also tends to be earlier in the spring when the spores are produced in the cedar apple rust. But here's what cedar apple rust looks like once it starts producing what are called the telial horns. Um, I don't think it, maybe I'm used to it, but I don't think it looks that bad. I know that we had a call, we had a call once from uh, a woman who said, you know, I work in a veterinary lab and I don't get grossed out by many things, but this is grossing me out. <laughs> she was concerned, though, that this might be harmful to her dogs. I think that was the reason for her call, which is not. What do you do about it? You can come and prune these out, yes. But this is a, I'll say more about this disease in a moment <coughs> and, and get to that. Um, so, spots on, as we know, these are bracts, not petals, of uh, the dogwoods. Oh, sorry. <laughs> the best See? strategy here is to be patient. <laughs> this is because, again, the infection already occurred. So when you're seeing this, anything you do now is not going to help for this year. So your strategy has to be thinking about next year. And next year the weather may be different, it may be worse, it may be... Why would we... That's, um, it may be worse next year, it may be less severe. Some years it looks like you know, frost hit the tree, some years you couldn't buy uh, an infected blossom. So patience is basically the, the main recommendation. In certain extreme circumstances, there may be some, some interventions you want to do, but in general, not. Do we still have that dogwood or that fix or whatever? Okay, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. The question was, do we still have that, and the word you're looking for is dogwood anthracnose. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen it for a long time. Um, I've been doing my current job diagnosing ornamentals for over 10 years, and I don't think I've had a case during that time. Now, this is, this is where names can get you in trouble. This disease here is called spot anthracnose of dogwood. I'm glad you asked the question because I forgot to say what this was. This is spot anthracnose of dogwood. This is not dogwood anthracnose. This one, spot anthracnose, is a cosmetic problem and pretty much occurs wherever you're going to grow dogwood in the state. Dogwood anthracnose is actually a canker disease that will kill a tree, but it only occurs basically in a diagonal line from Rockingham County southwestward and then west of that. So it's basically a, a higher elevation. Or if you go farther north and not, not as high an elevation, farther north in the country. So if you're around here, you won't have dog bed infections. I think there was maybe one case in Dare County, but it's a tree that had been transplanted from somewhere else.
So let's move into summertime now. Some things that you can recognize yourselves. Question. True or false? These are two stages of the same disease on apple leaves. Could be apple, could be crab apple. Notice in the photo that was taken by Matt Bertone, so the person who sent it in thought, thought they had an insect issue, but it's not. All right, what do you think? Is it true? Well, the other one's false, so this one must be true. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this, is a, this is, again, cedar apple rust. It has this curious life cycle where it has to go from one kind of a plant in one stage and then transfer over to another kind of plant. So the, the spores that were produced on those ugly gelatinous telio horns on the junipers blew over in the wind and they found an apple tree, a crab apple tree. First they produced in the early stages these pycnia on the upper leaf surface and then later what we call isia on the underside. These are highly magnified but you can see them with a hand lens like this. And that's where the spores are produced that will blow over to the junipers and infect those. And then it, it takes all the rest of that summer and then, and then another year of development to, uh, to produce the galls. So what you look like in uh, a gross view of the leaf is you'll see these bright yellow to orange blotches on the undersurface, flip it over and look for, look for leaves. So this gets back to your question, what do we do about it? Now, one thing is there are differences in susceptibility among cultivars. So you could look for, if you're just planting it, look for something that is going to be less susceptible. In controlling the phase on the, the fruit host, then you're probably going to want to have a spray program that would, that would include something here, especially if you have junipers nearby. So that's the other thing. If you have control over the landscape, if you own you know, the, the, uh, a, a large section of land on which these are, you can try and eliminate the alternate host so that it doesn't go back and forth as easily. That's obviously most most people don't have that kind of opportunity or control on a on a homeowner level. One that you are sure to see is this one. This is a relative. This is quince rust. Remember, we saw the swelling on a juniper that was not as as great. Uh, this is what it'll do once it gets onto the the flowering pears. Which, uh, if you're not a big fan of flowering pears, then then yes. <laughs> um, but it's even worse when it gets this disease it forms these spore producing structures on the fruit mostly sometimes on the stem like this um, we got a call once it's one of those calls it's kind of the worst kind where the husband's on the phone talking but it's the wife in the background you hear <laughs> who's coming up with the questions and concerns and so one of their worries was that they didn't they were concerned that their neighbors were going to blame them for being the source. So like, are we the source or, or are we the victims here? And I asked, do you have any junipers? And they said, no. And I said, okay, well, then you're the victim. <laughs> so this had to come, this infection had to come from the juniper. It doesn't go, doesn't repeat on the pair of It's kind of unusual in that way. All right. <coughs> yes, quick. So, but it's called the quince rust. So the, is part of that cycle also you have the quince bushes? Yeah, the quince would be another uh, another host of the same stage it gets on the pear. So it goes from the juniper and it can affect quince and it can affect pear. There's another one called hawthorn rust. So these have multiple different hosts, but they tend to name it after one. What causes yellowing in this tomato leaf? Bacteria, a fungus, a virus, or none of the above? Right, none of the above. This is, remember I said it's not always a disease? This is classic, classic, classic Glyphosate injury on tomato. The bright yellow discoloration at the base of the leaflets like this. So tomatoes are very sensitive to glyphosates. If you spray Roundup or another glyphosate containing product and a little bit of drift got over, this is what you will see, if not worse. True or false, this is a harmless fungus. All right, trick question, because it is harmless, but it's not a fungus. <laughs> This is, this is what's called a, it's a type of slime mold. It's the one we most often see. Some slime molds are quite beautiful, actually, when you look at them up close. This one, not so much. Um, it starts out as this, it's called a plasmodium that just kind of lives in the bark and the mulch. 
engulfing bits of bacteria and organic matter, so it's not harmless if it forms this yellow, frothy stuff. Um, and then eventually turns a darker color, gets a crust on it, and a pink crust that if you break open, then the spores are there and completes the life cycle. So it's kind of a nuisance in mulch landscape beds, but it is not harmful. You may even see it kind of coming up on plants or, or structures before it converts into its foreground. The, the common name of this is the dog vomit slime mold. The scientific name is a little prettier, fully go septic. True or false, this tree should be removed. It's got this frothy, uh, kind of a, a sour smell to it. Um, it will often attract butterflies, wasps, other insects to it. Here it's, here it's so much that it's puddling on the ground. This is very common in the middle of the summer, especially on white oaks, but uh, occasionally on other hardwoods. So, is this tree a goner? No. Should we remove it? No. Well, again, a little bit of a trick question, but if this is the only problem, then it doesn't need to be removed. Not to say the tree doesn't have other problems, but this is called slime flux. And uh, a long story, but basically a bacterial colonization of the wood produces something called wet wood. And the pressure that's built up there by the activity of these bacteria will force the sap out through the, the surface and it ferments and it causes this outward slime flux. And it may flux one, your tree may flux this year and not next year, or again, it's going to be very, but not a serious issue. Now very quickly, we only have six minutes left to have some problems that you can recognize in any season. I'll just ask it this way. Which one of these is black spot? The middle one. The middle one, B. How do you know? Well, yeah, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, other, the other thing is that the margin of the spot itself, notice how it's kind of feathered and irregular versus the cercospor leaf spot that's more of a solid. <coughs> Or, or entire margin. Both will cause yellowing, both will cause leaf drop. Uh, you may see one or the other. Some rows are susceptible to one and not to the other, but that's how you tell that. It's a black spot with that feathered margin as well as the yellowing leaf drop. This is downy mildew here. You probably won't ever see that in the landscape. It's a production problem. It can be very serious in, uh, in roses and in nurseries. A right, uh, closer view of that irregular edge of the black spot. This one, if you've got, this basically is why we don't see people growing red to anymore. It gets on that, it gets on also Indian hawthorn. It's called Entinosporium leaf spot, and will cause these reddish spots with gray centers. And if you look under the, the, the hand lens, you'll see the little blister like spore producing structures there. Here one of your keys is going to be, if you starting off and you want to eat the hawthorn, they're nice plants, but find one that's in the less susceptible category, not one of the more susceptible varieties. Quickly, in which of these problems was an insect involved? A, B, both, or neither? Sorry, A. Remember Steve talked about all those aphids and things that grow on, uh, or live on tulip poplars? Well, they produce honeydew. That honeydew is a wonderful medium for growing fungi. And this is, this is just sooty mold on the right here, on the left, excuse me, that grew on that, on that uh, those secretions, that honeydew. The test is just rub it, and if it rubs off easily, then that's what it is, sooty mold. On the right, that's shot hole. That is, in this particular case, well, this is common on cherry and cherry laurel. And in this particular case, it was a fungus called Pasolora circumcissa, great name. And the dead areas, the plant just walls them off and they drop up. Where can I learn more? Some key <coughs> resources. Again, these are on your sheet, so very, very quickly. Your number one go-to place if you have a problem is your county cooperative extension service. If you're fortunate enough to live in a county like Wake, where we have an extension, extension master gardener volunteer program, then those are the people who will be your first contact. Uh, if not, you have your county cooperative extension agents who can help you. If you stump them, right, we've got their backs. So mm -hmm. then the sounds come. Now we do accept things directly from the public, but we ask people to go first to their 
on a cooperative extension office. They can many, answer many things for free, and you get a discount if it comes to us through them. They do have the same thing. The North Carolina Extension Gardener Handbook, uh, award-winning book. Um, chapter 5 is about diseases, so that's a great resource. There's also chapters on insects and compost and about anything you can imagine. It's available free online, or if you'd like to have a physical book, you can actually buy that. As mentioned in my introduction, there is a program that we do every fourth Thursday of the month from February through October called Plants, Pests, and Pathogens. Now, this is only open to master, uh, extension master garden volunteers and county agents in the live session where we have some interactive things. But anybody can go on and view the recordings afterwards. So if you want to uh, imbibe the wisdom from Matt Berton, our entomologist in the clinic, and, uh, and try and survive another uh, presentation by me, which you can actually skip over in the, in, the, in the recording if you want, but those are those are available. We cover a variety of different topics and uh, in a little bit more detail than we've done here. <coughs> Our plant disease and insect clinic website will be undergoing some improvements soon, but that's where you want to go to see what kind of sample you should take, and I'll show you a bad example in a moment. But we will hopefully this winter come up with our BOLO list, or be on the lookout. So for each month, you'll see, oh, these are the kind of insect problems, these are the kind of plant disease problems that I may face. Right, this is one of the worst samples we ever got. Right? <laughs> Two leaves, and it was supposed to represent four different kinds of plants. <laughs> um, all of so we asked for good, good samples. Again, go on our website to, to see that. I've used up all of one minute, so I don't have much time for questions, but really quickly, I guess if we have one. Yes? Very good question. The question is, if you have a plant die from root rot, can you treat the soil and plant something else there? Treatment of the soil uh, for a homeowner is, is futile. There are even if you had access to some of the really strong chemicals for fumigation, that's only a temporary measure. You wouldn't want to even try to do that. So the, the trick there is to figure out what root rot you had so that you can choose something that won't be susceptible later. Or let's say in the case of our malaria, you let um, a couple of years pass before you plant any woody material so that it breaks down. So it depends on what your root rot was. That's why the diagnosis is important, even after the fact. You're not going to save that plant, but you're going to know what to do going forward. Yes? Is there something, I had a tree that like within a week went from looking okay to looking bad. Is there something that we should immediately look for in the sense of knowing it's not in a saturated point where it wouldn't be overwatered? Am I looking, is there something immediately to kind of go to first? either to diagnose or rule out, well, it can't be this because the latency period, or it may be this because of the time that it occurred. Is there any, you know, direction that you could, as a starting off point, to look at? In that case, the first thing I would always look for is any evidence of lightning injury. So split, split bark down, down the edge, right? Uh, and shortly after a thunderstorm. Now, we do have trees that have died uh, after all the rain, the record rainfall last year. And then we had things turn dry in April and May of this year. So we had a lot of trees, uh, oaks especially, and especially down toward the southeast part of the state, that we think were just that combination of too much water then, not enough water now. And they, as Barbara Ferrer would say, they, they kind of, uh, what she called, they kind of accumulate problems. They remember their, their things that have happened to them, and eventually it's just can't deal with it anymore. South. But there's a lot of things that could be, but very often there are things that have been building up for a while you just uh, aren't able to perceive it. And then, so. oh, zero, oh, I'm showing zero time, sorry. I'll be around for the break at least, um, then I'm heading over to the lab. But uh, yes, if uh, you have any questions, you want to grab me, that's great.